Uh, my PhD is in the study of catastrophic fires, so I'm going to be talking about biomass in terms of uh, use it or lose it. Um, I'm going to pick up where Sarah left off, kind of, in that I'll be differentiating between live and dead biomass and looking at uh, changes over time. But the time frame I'm going to be looking at is about 200 years, from 1800 uh, to about the present. I've got about two buttons extra more than I can handle here, so let's see. There we go. Uh, the study area that I'm going to be talking about is the um, um, South Umpqua uh, area in Western Oregon Cascades. The lower area is about 1,100 foot elevation. The upper area is the ridge line about 6,000 foot. And uh, the, the reason uh, that we studied this area is this general trend from the 1960s to the present. Uh, we've gone from about 4 million acres of wildfire a year to about 10 million acres. And our suppression costs have gone from about 50 or 100 million a year to about 2 billion. And the other research I've done has shown that the 2 billion figure is about uh, one tenth uh, to one fiftieth of the total cost of damage uh, by wildfire. Uh, I'm going to use an acronym. That means it's uh, related to the U.S. government somehow. Uh, fire regime condition class is the 1800 time frame, the so-called pre-settlement or natural historical. Uh, FRCC3 is a, a large deviation from that time frame. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, these two differences primarily over a 200-year period. Uh, the person that commissioned this is the commissioner of Douglas County, uh, Joe Lawrence. He's known as Biomass Joe. <laughs> and what he did was put out a NACO resolution, national resolution, to uh, convert all FRCC3 lands to FRCC1, and that was the basis for our uh, research. His interest is in creating products that uh, local rural communities can uh, use to affect uh, restoration. We had Chad talk about that earlier today. Uh, here's the weather, or the fire triangle, weather, fuel, topography, ignition. Wildfire ignitions have largely uh, gone from people to um, lightning in the last several years. Fuel has increased, as Sarah has shown, and I will show it's been increasing for a while. There's that dead wood we haven't been talking about so much. That's wind shake or snow break. Um, this is a Douglas fir stand at about 5,000 foot elevation. It's flammable. And uh, Texas and Arizona and other areas of, uh, this year are good examples. San Diego, uh, all through Oregon. This is an old one. This is not a new problem. In, on August 20, 1933, um, 180,000 acres of the Tillamook fire burned up, uh, or Tillamook forest burned up, what became the Tillamook forest. The mushroom cloud was 40 miles wide, 8 miles high. It's a lot of air pollution, a lot of carbon. The dead wood and the live wood, what we haven't mentioned so far, is dead wood is rotting. So it's producing carbon dioxide every year. It produces a lot at once, and then it just keeps going. And that kills everything. It's a stand replacement event. That's Ben Stout. He used to work in this area a lot. And you can see it takes out the old growth, and we've got a lot of, of ladder fuels there. It affects the water. Um, this is the old uh, position, Har, uh, this kind of semi-famous quote. In 1959, he said, oh, we're talking about Indian burning. It's called Paiute burning in the 1920s. He didn't say any reason anybody would care. He could, it, to improve the forest didn't make sense to him. He thought it was a fantastic idea based on oral traditions. This is what he had in mind, the kind of fires we have now. All the teepees burst into flame, people escape by fire. Quadrupeds go nuts. But Robert Haswell, in 1788, going along the Oregon coast, says, well, we see a lot of fires, a lot of lawns, a beautiful landscape. It looks cultivated. Looks like it could support a lot of wildlife. And it support a lot of people, too. In the 1780s, there were principal language groups of Western Oregon, tribal groups. There's the Columbia River up there, Pacific Ocean. Salish, Chinookan, Athabascan, Yukonan, and so on. 
So here's Salish people. The women were as good with the canoe as, as the guys. Yakona people, this is after the Christians came in. They're wearing skirts and pants, and they got sawed logs. Here's a Chinookan woman. She's flattening the head of her kid, um, and she's tattooed and pierced. But she's got, like, she's up in the Portland area. My uh, daughter-in-law lives up there. She's got more tattoos and piercings. And people that think that's kind of crude, liposuction is more invasive and disfiguring. <laughs> Kalapunyan guy down here, he's got two conifers, forbs, which they eat. He's got a seal skin quiver. He's trained with the coast, you would bow. This landscape is managed by fire. And we're talking about millions of acres of uh, Western United States. Three ways of doing it, firewood gathering and burning. That takes out the dead wood, it's a commodity. Patch burning, rejuvenates berry, uh, berry patches and so on. Broadcast burning over large areas, unrestricted uh, uh, boundaries, typically done during fire season. Um, lots of results. And this is known uh, <clears throat> before Clara as well. These people actually camped out together. He's a surveyor. They, uh, he surveyed the area or study area. And he's pointing out that a short distance away, that Peavine Mountain used to be grass because Indians burn it every other year. So this isn't new information. But they also had large wood products. Here's uh, plank houses on the coast, ocean going canoes that could carry 25 or 30 people go out in the ocean when the American and European ships couldn't go out. Chinook and Lodge hold 30 families, 300 feet long, last 200 years, um, lots of woodwork. But there is a burnt, this is bare grass, it's burnt every two years. In two years, these fronds are perfect for weaving, valuable trading commodity. The uh, bulbs, like most lilies, were edible. And other animals liked it too, so these areas that were opened up into meadows and um, prairies were also game hunting areas. Then the oak savanna, uh, these oak would go two, three, four hundred years, probably 10, 12, 15 stems an acre, acorn crops and uh, uh, understory crops, tarweed, camas, other crops, so berries. They produced uh, acorn meal. Camas could be stored for, well, I'll get to it. Um, meal, uh, ground from uh, acorns, uh, could be stored for six months or a year. Blueberries, some of these fields were 10 and 20,000 acres in size. Total is a few million, probably. Salmonberry, hundreds of acres. Camas uh, covered over the, all of North America, several million acres. Uh, it's a major crop, probably through here as well. It has more protein than salmon or venison. Here's a relic prairie that used to be, uh, it's called Soapgrass Mountain. That's another name for bear grass. Willow, this whole area had been burnt at about 5,500 feet. Camas is dug though, so a lot of land was tilled particularly riparian areas. And these are the bulbs. In our project, we plotted every single bearing tree, 3,900 of them. Uh, the bearing trees were measured between 1856 and uh, 1935. The bulk of them me uh, measured between 1856 and 1910. These are the species, and you probably can't quite see it. They're arranged by uh, diameter, which is closely related to the age. In the lower elevation, the brown oak savanna, 1,000, 2,000 foot elevation. Highest elevation, true fir, um, Mount Hemlock. Um, intermediate, the large yellow is pine, and um, red is cedar. They pretty much cover the whole area. I haven't put Douglas fir in there because that's kind of a, a slide of itself. Uh, this is one of the ways we used to determine what the forest types were like in 1800. Another thing we used was understory vegetation, high elevation, huckleberries, brown everywhere, that's nuts, chinkapin, hazel, acorns, green, north slope, lower elevation, salal berries. And we came up with this veg pattern. These are trails, Indian trails, 
Some of them uh, were still being surveyed in the 1930s. Upper elevation, uh, subalpine conifer, just underneath it up to about 4,500 foot elevation, pretty much solid Douglas fir, darker green in through there, pine woodlands, 10, 12, 18 stems an acre, and lower area there, oak savanna, grasslands, prairies, uh, oak. So that was the FRCC1. Then we went over the whole area. Each one of those red dots is a photo point. And typically we took a whole 360 degree panorama and uh, we took GPS coordinates, created a GIS layer obviously, took about 5,000 total photos to see what relic plants were in place and if we could differentiate between um, ages, between 1800 and subsequent. Major pattern we found, here's all of the bearing trees that are Douglas fir. And you can see at the up to 4,500 foot elevation, the large diameter trees, a couple of hills, but they've covered everywhere. They moved everywhere. Most of those um, size classes are small to medium, small to medium dots. So the question is, did these follow a, um, a, a, a stand replacement event, such as a wildfire, which is what I was taught in school? They had a fire and then they seeded in, or did they invade? Did they move into prairies and woodlands and savannas of, um, to an absence of fire? So here's some measurements. This is just a typical one. On uh, Squaw Flat, 1825, we cored uh, trees. We had 10 areas we used, each one about seven or 800 acres. Wanted to get a landscape perspective. Um, the dark blue is Douglas fir. 1825, here is the uh, distribution of species by, di by diameter. 2010, Douglas fir in every diameter class has increased significantly. We found about 10 times more stems an acre between 1800 and then in 2000. And that's a pattern we've seen all through the Pacific Northwest. The actual volume, biomass volume, and this is only eight inch diameter and larger trees, estimated about 10 times. A thousand percent increase in biomass, about a thousand percent increase in stem count. So um, here's the 1800 FRCC1 pattern. That red through there is the FRCC3 pattern overlaid. These are made entirely independent of one another. We put them together and uh, presented them on the same day that we put them together. Actually, yeah, the same day. You'll see that these follow the riparian areas and there's a strong correlation between the pine woodlands and the Douglas fir area and they've invaded into the uh, subalpine fir area. So the Douglas fir has moved into all of the adjacent areas and created apparently a, a, a FRCC3 condition. Here's the riparian area. That's for illustration. There's a person there. You can see that it's uh, got a lot of coarse wood debris in it. They said it's good for fish. Here's a meadow. It's called Huckleberry Lake. We found a puddle in it. There are the 1825 trees. Here's the invasive trees and they've moved into the meadow, they've drained the lake, and they've increased the stem count probably about 10 times. Here is an oak savanna area. There's an oak, there's a person, there's a uh, ponderosa, and there's a sugar pine, and all the rest of those are Douglas fir. There's no evidence of a burn. This is all invasive. And it's similar all over 230,000 acres. Here's the pine area. There's a the pine. Douglas fir, little madrone, a lot of litter. These are um, typical. These aren't unusual or, or select. Well, they're selected because they illustrate a point, but they illustrate a point that we found everywhere. Here's the Douglas fir area. Douglas fir, yellow pine, and the invasive trees, some of them are 30 to 40 inches in diameter. Those are trees that have grown up since uh, Indians were removed from the landscape. We've got a screen on the east side that says we're not supposed to remove any trees over 21 inches, but most of these trees, not most of them, but a lot of them, 
are over 30 inches. And they're um, competing with the old growth. They're actually killing them off. They're creating ladder fuels, contiguous canopy. And this is what happens. 2009, they had the first two stand replacement events of any magnitude within the study area that we could determine over the last three or 400 years. This is 3,000 acres that went up one morning. This is a Rainbow Creek fire. And um, another one just nearby was about 7,000 acres. So about, I think, total 13,000 acres of stand replacement events. They'd had a 60,000 acre fire here before, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, but it was a spot fire and it concentrated on certain fuel types and really didn't have um, this type of result. This is the result that we have here. And you can see again, young trees, no evidence of older snags or larger trees, hundreds of them. We can see dozens right there, and they're all dead. Naturally, they went underneath and planted more trees to replace them. Um, here are relic Indian prairies. Around them are a few living trees. This area burned off in 1920. Most of these diameters are under 24 inches. We've got a contiguous fuel canopy. Contiguous canopy makes a, for a stand replacement event. That's the area we saw go up in smoke uh, the previous year. And we can see that this prairie, here's an old Indian trail here. This whole area was prairie in uh, 1850. So it's all been replaced with um, firewood. So we're talking about um, uh, dead trees. Here's a picture co uh, from Colorado, I think. Kulikowski, I think he's on campus here. Uh, and Jarvis did this study. And they said, what's more volatile? Uh, dead um, lodgepole with, the, with the, um, the needles on them? Or after the needles have fallen? And they've shown that um, the, uh, having the fine fuels does not make the stand riskier. That the correlation between fires and lodgepole stands um, does not correlate to uh, whether the needles are on the trees or not. When they're like this, you can smell the air. It smells like turpentine, and you can hear the bugs. That's pretty impressive. Now here's the red zone in Oregon, and it turned gray. So now we got, I think this area is about 230,000 acres. Uh, this is from a lookout tower. If you look at the, from the lookout tower in the 1930s or an aerial photo, you'll see a scattering of old growth ponderosa. These are invasive lodgepole. The bugs have killed the ponderosa. We're told that young trees aren't affected by bugs. Plantations near here, uh, which were put in by Weyerhaeuser 30 years ago, equally devastated. When the fire goes through there, it'll kill the green trees too. The difference is, when the trees are red, the fire is crown. When the trees are on the ground, they smolder and they fry the soil. So you get air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution, dead wildlife, um, a loss of grazing land. Um, I think the aesthetics here kind of suck. Other people say, oh, it's beautiful. It's like nature. This fire return interval that we're experiencing now is uh, unprecedented. It's, uh, it's got a minor precedence on a regional basis like the Tillamook area where Indian populations died, fire was removed from the environment, Trees invaded, they formed ladder fuels, contiguous canopies, and burst into flames with any ignition. So the problem is, and the opportunity is, um, what to do with the dead trees, what to do with the excess trees, whether we really want to re uh, return to an FRCC1 condition. Uh, I think it's a regulation or something. So conclusions. Catastrophic wildfires are deadly, costly, and destructive. 
regular landscape scale prescribed fires, as exemplified by Indian burning practices, can significantly reduce the likelihood and severity of modern wildfire risks. Fuel levels need to be reduced. We can't have fire remove fuel levels that are five and ten times the historical high. These are unprecedented. These fires that are occurring now in severity are significantly greater. Intensity, significantly greater. It's unprecedented. There's no um, baseline to measure the fires that we're having now, in the last, particularly the last 30 years. In order to let lightning burn uh, safely without creating a lot more damage to the environment, we've got to get the fuel out of the way. When the Indians burnt, bare grass meadows and oak savannas and so on, the fuels per acre were like maybe two tons. Now it's 50 or 100 times that great. Okay, removing dead trees and shrubs and invasive conifers from forests and grasslands allows the safe reintroduction of fire. To return to fire means return to prescribed fires ignited by humans, not lightning fires on, on a haphazard basis, not with fuels out of control uh, the way they've become the last 200 years or even the last 20 years. Um, converting these fuels to useful products for the people that are worried about carbon dioxide. I, I kind of like carbon dioxide, but people are worried about it. Um, if we can convert it to products to stop the trees from rotting, we've delayed the process, we've locked the carbon that much longer. To do that is labor intensive, creates lots of jobs, lots of opportunity, not government jobs, but real jobs of people going out, producing power, producing heat, producing two by fours, veneers, chips, and um, producing tax revenue rather than using it. So um, my bottom line is that the landscape restoration means restoring people to the landscape. We're not pathogens, we're critical elements, and maybe especially children. And by people, I mean fire. If we're going to return fire to the landscape, let's do it in a positive, hopefully scientific, common sense manner. What we're doing now is destroying our forests. And now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> this